this computer. <laughs> and then we're going to go live on Facebook after I do my present. So let's just do the recording. All right. So, and then I'm going to go share again. All right. Cool. So, uh, Rachel, thank you for being here. <laughs> this is our first uh, meeting for Finest Women in Real Estate. I'm so excited to have you, and uh, we are going to talk about dual agency. Yeah. Uh, with the, uh, oh, there's Alma. Alma, hi. How are you? Can you see us? Hi, Alma. <laughs> Can you hear us, Alma? Hi, Hello. Alma. Hi. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, great to have you on board. And we were hoping to have another one, but we're going to go ahead and start the meeting, okay? okay. So, um, as you all know, this is uh, Finest Women in Real Estate. My name is Marie Waite. I am the founder and the CEO of this company, and we started the company in 2014. So, uh, today we're going to be doing some educational discussion, and Rachel Lamar is a real estate lawyer and also a real estate broker in San Diego. And she is going to talk about dual agency, which is a general discussion about uh, a quick description of what it entails and what it, what it is very scary for agents to be involved in representing both sides of a real estate transactions. So what I wanted to do is I actually wanted to um, go ahead and um, let's see, I'm going to go do this real quick. All right. So we can see all of you. I was hoping to do the um, the PowerPoint later, but I'll, I'll try and do that. So Rachel, I'm going to pass it on to you, and you can go ahead and you know get, tell us why um, this is such an issue for the real estate professionals, and why do they really have to be cautious about the whole process? Yeah. So first of all, I just want to say my voice is kind of going in and out, so I apologize. I hopefully it'll last. <laughs> <I'm> okay. <talking. laughs> um, okay, it just keeps disappearing. I don't know what's happening. But <clears throat> anyway, dual agency is uh, a lot of agents really love it. They want to represent when you represent both sides of the transaction, and it can either be one agent representing the buyer and the seller or a broker representing both parties, where there's two different agents. So. Um, Agents obviously love it because they get a dual commission. And, uh, but the thing is that there are eight states in the United States and probably more to come. Hopefully California will be one of them uh, that don't allow this. And the reason is because dual agency, when you are an agent for someone, you are their fiduciary. So you, are, you have to represent them to the best of your ability. So for example, if you represent a seller, your job is to get the seller the best price on their home. The seller might give you some information as to what they will or will not accept, things like that, like this. And if you represent a buyer, your best job is to get them the best price. Now, when you're negotiating things like repair issues and price, um, if you're representing both parties, it's impossible. And I always say to someone, tell me, tell me one way that this makes sense where you can represent the buyer and the seller. Um, and some people still don't get it. So I always give this example. If you were in a court of law and someone was suing you, would you go to their attorney and ask him or her to represent you? First of all, it's illegal. They can't do that. But, um, no, of course not because their duties are to that party. You need someone who has your duties in mind. So that's the problem with dual agency is that it is, it is impossible to represent to opposing parties and if you're going to be negotiating anything how can you fairly negotiate on behalf of two opposing parties i see now um rachel can you give us uh can you give them some information in terms of how long have you been in the real estate industry and uh in regards to your um uh legal services how does that work with your real estate profession well, I am a licensed attorney in California, but I don't practice law. So I don't have a legal practice per se. I could, but I don't. Um, I choose to just do real estate and I may have a real estate brokerage. I've been doing um, selling residential real estate for 17 years. And uh, the great thing is, is my legal background really helps me because I think I have a different perspective than the average agent does on issues such as this. 
So um, while I don't practice law anymore, I'm still, uh, you know, very much a part of it and keep up on everything. And my license is active in California. Okay, I see. And uh, I know we had this discussion at one of our TV episodes. Uh, Alma, um, this is the first time I met you, Alma. Is, um, can you give us a little bit of information about your real estate um, background so at least we can uh, relate to what you're needing or how you can benefit from this session? Uh, well, um, my husband and I own a construction company. And uh, we just actually invested in our first investment property. And I'm uh, starting to become more interested in real estate. So that's why I joined um, this meeting. Okay. Well, that's good. What about you, Nanette? Um, so I've uh, been interested in real estate all my life. So about two and a half years ago, um, I got my license. And I've been uh, doing real estate that time. And... Um, just loving it. Every moment I get a chance to do it, I just have fun. Okay. Now, um, let me ask both of you. Uh, have you had an experience where you uh, ended up representing both uh, sellers and buyers? I have not. Okay. What about you, Alma? No. <laughs> okay. Not so Okay, so Rachel, since uh, both of them have not had any experience, what are the things that uh, they should really... Um, you know, be cautious about it before taking that kind of transaction? So first of all, I just want to say that I have done a couple of, I have done a couple of these less, I can count on one hand, um, where I have represented both sides and they've worked out beautifully. Um, I think that in certain situations, you could argue that it's a, it's a good idea, um, kind of when everyone has the same goal, like if it's an investor, it's two investors selling a property. Um, but, um, I think just in general that an average agent who goes ahead and does this kind of thing and represents both parties can really get themselves into trouble. Um, so they have to be very careful. And, uh, there's, there's a California Supreme Court ruling that came out in 2016, um, that basically gave, said that if, if it was Coldwell Banker and they had a Coldwell Banker agent representing the seller and representing the buyer, two different agents. But the, the Supreme Court said that those agents were responsible for telling the buyer anything, disclosing anything about the property, and, out, and not just disclosing, but they have to look into it and find out any information that um, should be disclosed to the buyer. And this applied to the listing agent who wasn't representing the buyer, but because they were with the same brokerage, they both were responsible for that. So I think as we move forward, that somewhere in time there will be a case that will go up to the California Supreme Court about this, about one agent representing both parties. And at some point in time, um, it will hopefully be outlawed. So being that I'm an attorney, I can, I can see some of the, you know, things that we want to avoid in a situation like this, but still um, my preference is to not do it. Um, in certain cases, you know, Again, like if you have two investor type clients, it's, it's often, it can be done, but um, I did have a bad experience with someone this past year, a, client, a good client, um, and I, I don't know that I want to, I don't think I'm going to be doing these kinds of things anymore. So I've, I've been on the bandwagon to outlaw them, and um, that's, that's where it is. And I think my advice would be if you're just starting out in real estate, that this is not something you want to do. And your broker, most, some of the, some of the brokerages around here um, and in California won't allow it anyway. So what I would suggest to someone is to find uh, an independent broker or an agent from another brokerage that you trust and you can refer out the buyer client to that person. Okay, I just um, opened up uh, your, um, where you guys can also uh, say something here. This is the time where we, if you have any questions for Rachel, it will be uh, a good time. Alma, do you have any questions for Rachel? Um, is there, do you think there's, um, is there like a place where you can look up more of this information in terms of real estate and, um, um, just ways of going about when you're buying something. Cause I know that, um, 
when it comes to property management, the, there's a website called CARS that gives you a little bit more information on those transactions. I'm not sure if real estate has something like that. Are you talking about the California Association of Realtors, CAR? The, the CAR website? Yeah, they have like, do you know, do they have like um, answers to the, like this type of question on there? Um, you know, I don't know if CAR, I, I would assume CAR must have something about dual agency. Um, I would though, if you want more information, I mean, you can just kind of put into Google dual agency and real estate and look it up. Um, it happens all the time. There's, there's a lot of people who do these things, but, um, you know, just like with any, with anything in real estate, if you're buying a property and something isn't disclosed to you or something goes wrong within the transaction that's discovered later, you as a buyer end up coming back and suing the seller, even down the road, right? So with dual agency, because of some of the pitfalls, you have to, you know, it's better to have your own representation. Um, it's, and so it's kind of, you know, sellers, I've had sellers say to me, you know, you know, I don't care, represent the buyer, that's fine, that's fine. And I've had people, you know, ask me to do the same thing. Um, and, and I have done it for, for mostly in the case of investor clients, but um, also for um, a few residential resales. And um, the sellers like it because the commission gets reduced on the buying side, so they save money. The buyers like it because because the commission's reduced, usually it's reduced on that side, the buyers save money. So everybody seems to be happy with the money saving thing, but where you have to be careful is with negotiation. So if you have a property where, um, you know, it's like two investors and there's no, no one's asking anyone to repair anything type, that kind of situation, it, it, it would make a little more sense. But still, um, I would just look up, I would look on, uh, car website and also you can google dual agency and there's a lot of articles on it Zip, <clears throat> excuse me zillow has an article on it Julia, um there's some some newspaper articles on it as well you find the case um Horiki versus coldwell banker from 2016 which has a lot of information okay, okay. What, thank you. what about you nanette do you have any questions for rachel yes i was wondering if um any instances where in residential where dual agency is actually a benefit? Well, like I said, I mean, I mean, <laughs> the answer, the, the general answer is no. Um, but like I said, you know, I've done it before for in, where we have two investor, an investor seller, an investor buyer, and those parties all agree there's no repairs. It's not an emotional decision. And in those cases, it's a little it's a little easier because investor clients usually have a very savvy financial perspective but um i've been i've i've seen a lot of dual agency cases with other agents that um are really they really scare me and there are a lot of lawsuits in real estate and the the main cause of action for most real estate lawsuits is failure to disclose or negligence and so if you think about it, like I said in the beginning, if you are representing a seller and then the buyer comes along and you're representing the buyer and how can you adequately represent both parties such that you're not being negligent? I mean, I, I just don't, it's hard to find an answer to that. And um, yes, it's allowed, but for, I mean, even for an attorney, you know, who can see all the pitfalls and be very careful and that kind of thing, it's, I still think it shouldn't be allowed. So, like I said, um, no, <laughs> I, I, I've written a lot of blogs about this. I don't think that we should look at, try to find the positives of the situation because there's just too many lawsuits that have happened from dual agency representations. So I think we need to just across the board in California, you know, get rid of it. So what, what is the consequence for the brokers if uh, they have an agent that ended up getting lawsuit because of this? Well, so if, if somebody gets sued, if let's say a buyer goes and sues the broker, um, the broker and the broker's agent, the agent's going to have to pay, uh, you know, the deductible for the insurance, the broker's going to have to pay. There's going to, I mean, most of the cases are settled and don't go anywhere, but um, like, one that did, it went up all the way up to the state Supreme Court. So I think that, um, you know, the consequence, depending on 
what kind of action you're talking about. I mean, if there was just blatant negligence or someone, there was fraud or there was, you know, who knows by an agent, which has happened, um, that agent could lose their license and be fine. Um, as far as, you know, jail time, I'm not really sure um, what the statute is on that. But, um, the, and that, that we're talking like, you know, flat out where someone fraudulently does something or, but if it's just like a negligence question, it's usually going to be um, probably a fine and possibly losing a license. So that's why a lot of brokerages now, they, they don't even allow their agents to do this. And the fact that this is starting just tells you that, or it's been happening, but now more and more brokers are not allowing it. And it tells you that um, the brokers are scared because they don't want any, any inference of impropriety. Okay, so um, I forgot to mention Alma that we are uh, recording this um, session and we're also live on Facebook. Uh, so I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Okay. Um, so anyway, do you guys have any other questions? No, I. Rachel covered everything. <laughs> okay. All right. And Nanette, are you um, are you good with this information that you learned from Rachel? Yes, although I would say that um, when I've been in open houses, I have some people that come in and say, um, I want to work with the listing agent. I mean, the buyers actually want to do um, the yeah. agency. So um, do you have any suggestions about that? So that's that's a hard thing because i get the same thing and i get people calling me on my listings and saying hey i want you to represent me and actually um i just met some clients on a house that ended up working with them on something else and they um but initially met me at at an open house and they said hey if we make an offer would you represent us and so a lot of people a lot of buyers think that if they go directly to the listing agent they're gonna they're gonna get a deal because if the listing agent cuts his or her commission to the seller, then the buyer will possibly get a lower price. That's their thinking. So there are people who do go out there and search out the listing agents. But I think we just need to educate uh, buyers about this because, and you know, there are disclosures that we give all our clients and the disclosures clearly state that, you know, it's possible that your agent may be representing the buyer and the seller and you have to understand the, you know, consequences of this and they all parties sign two disclosures with every real estate transaction whether or not there's dual agency so that information is always presented with your contract it's on those forms but i think it's a it's a great idea to have this conversation with the buyers and explain to them why it isn't in their best interest to work with you as a listing agent in purchasing that house and and I think what you can do, like I said, is if you have somebody who you really trust, another agent in a, in a different company, um, you can kind of find like a, um, a partner where you can say, hey, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. If you have a listing and you get a you know, dual agency situation, you can pass it on to me and get a referral fee, and then you can represent those people. So um, that makes it all okay because now they have separate representation. So a lot of buyers who don't understand this, I, I bring up the analogy with the court and then it, it kind of, you see a light bulb go off in their head and they say, Oh, that makes sense <laughs> because it's a fiduciary, which is the highest duty you can have to somebody. And so if you have a fiduciary duty to one, how can you have a fiduciary to the other? Okay. Uh, Monica, how are you doing? I'm good. Hold on. Let me click on this again. <laughs> <laughs> we were all Hold on, where is my video? Okay. There you go. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Glad to see you. So we have Rachel here. We have Alma and Annette. Okay. And okay. Monica is one of our um, reality stars from Finest Women in Real Estate. And you moved to a different um, uh, state. Am I right? Yes. Do you see how dark it is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what state did you move in? North, North Carolina. North Carolina, and uh, and you bought a new house too. Yes. Yes. Oh wow. <laughs> so we kept the the house. We still have the house in Oceanside, but we rented it out and then um, purchased this house in North okay. Carolina. Can you just uh, introduce North yourself Carolina. to everybody? It's beautiful there. Yeah. It really is. I'm very fortunate to have this opportunity to be here. Okay. It's, 
Um, so Mon Monica Stone, um, I am a wholesale mortgage broker. I'm, and then I'm a realist realtor also. It went black. There you go. Oh, it did? did. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I have known Marie for a number of years when she, we first got in touch about the uh, finest women in real estate. And originally my story was then working through real estate and, you know, battling cancer and getting through it. And then, you know, finding um, um, the other women in the group and, oh, that's better. I flipped it over. <laughs> um, and then, you know, finding, you know, resources from them and um, support and then everything, you know, everyone struggles with to sort of get through family and business. So I'm, I'm glad to, sorry to be tardy for the call. I just had other calls that I couldn't get off of. <laughs> okay. And you, you also, you also do loans, right? Yeah. That, and that's why the move was easy for me because loans are remote anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And now I have a prettier office so at my house <laughs> looking at a lake. <laughs> you should do a Zoom call of your uh, lake so we can all see it. I'm going to do a video of that. There's, we have 17 acres and a lake and no one, I can see if someone's coming down our private little roads and it's, okay. it was like about the same price as our house in California originally was before it got some equity, but yeah. <laughs> well, it will be good to, uh, to uh, educate us on the market um, over there. So, you know, who knows, we could do, um, you know, agents can give some referrals to you and you can do the same thing for the agents here in California. For sure. I, um, because I've been putting off my broker exams. I did all my classes and stuff for that. I actually am coming, well, I push it to February. I'm coming back next week in California for a couple of weeks. So I have some clients that I'm doing real estate with, and then I'll be back and forth for that over the next six months. Um, otherwise doing loans at home. And then once I have my broker license there, I don't have to do anything except do the test here in North Carolina. So okay. I'm waiting to do that so I can get going in North Carolina, especially as I've been meeting so many people and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, you know, I don't want to have my hands tied here. Okay. Well, we <laughs> had a lot of this. Yeah. So we had a lot of discussion about dual agency. Do you have any questions for Rachel? Because Rachel gave a lot of information earlier. And and by the way, this is recorded. We are live in yeah. Facebook too. So you can see that later. Uh, but but definitely, do you have any questions about dual agency? No, and I'm so sorry I missed the initial information because I probably would have had a question to come off of um, that. Nothing comes to mind. I know that um, a lot of the time sellers expect, you know, a cut from one side or the other. If you are doing dual agency or having fears that, you're, you know, both parties can have fears of not representing one as well as the other. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure you covered some of that. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever uh, done a dual agency in your, as, a, as a broker or agent? No. I haven't. Yeah. Okay. I, it's not that I wasn't, uh, I've ever turned it down. It's just, I've never come across yeah. uh, that opportunity, well, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. <laughs> I actually, I actually have a personal story because I did have an agent who, um, who represented me and also represented the buyer. And oh, I felt like I didn't get the right, um, the right service from it. And, and because of that transaction, I actually uh, couldn't trust the people in the real estate. And that's why I got into the real estate because of that experience. And, uh, and I believe that if you are going to represent um, a client, I think you have to be giving a hundred percent commitment to that, uh, to that client. And if you are going to do dual, it will create a lot of distrust. And because that's what I experienced from the whole. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Especially, um, I've, I just find a lot of stories where the buyer will go straight to the selling agent because they think it's going to give them a benefit in the sense of knocking down the price because they're going to drop commission. Right. It's very commonly done. It's not like they're making up something to come forward with, but even more so if you're willing to do that, then it's like, who are you, you know, who are you siding with at that point? Yeah. Still, if you're making a cut somewhere and then but on the other side of the coin, if they're double ending it, like 
someone's thinking that it's still that you just may not be doing the best service. So you're just trying to pocket something without really full servicing both parties. I had, I had a, I actually had this past year, I had an experience with um, a client of mine and I uh, was selling their house and it wasn't selling, wasn't selling, wasn't selling. Someone had come along and offered a very low price. Um, they wouldn't, they didn't want that obviously. And then the, the buyer ended up coming back down the road and um, kind of, you know, asked me to represent them. And I, it was, it was really one of those situations where I, it's too old I felt uncomfortable at the, you know, at the time in, in doing that, but I fully disclosed it to my clients. They were really good clients of mine. And it turned out that we had some issues within the transaction with the lender and the lender was taking um, a really long time in getting things so to get the contingencies removed and so I worked very very hard um, I was on the phone for hours and hours with this lender and trying to fix this problem and it, in the long run my seller ended up feeling that um, she wasn't taken care of which I, I felt horrible about because I was working to save the, the whole transaction so right. I, I can see where you know I, I know I didn't do anything untoward I didn't you know, for toward my seller or my buyer, but um, it just put a really bad taste in my mouth at the end of the thing. And you know, um, anyway, I I I don't want to do it again. Um, I've always told people that it's not a good thing to do, so I guess I'm kind of a hypocrite when you know I say yes, I've done them. But um, you know, I always ask my clients, "Are you okay with this?" and explain to them. But still, it's it's just one of those it's things. It's always going to be a tough situation. Yeah. Something's going to come up, and I can imagine your seller felt like you were making excuses for the delays of their loan when you're just like you said, you're just trying to make the transaction happen for everyone. Yeah, yeah. and so you know, it was hard because it's it again. I was trying to get the loan stuff to finalize so that we can take the contingency off, and. Um, you know, it, I don't know. But anyway, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it puts you in a very difficult position, no matter what. And I think that, um, I, I don't think it should be allowed. And I think, you know, just the average Joe agent out there who's, you know, just, oh, cool, I'm going to make a double commission, you know, um, right. isn't really thinking about the ramifications, especially legalities of what could happen if something goes wrong. We, um, I actually approached the seller, the selling agent for this property because I, I was like, I said, I met with a buying agent when we went to view it. And I thought if she blows me out of the water, cool. You know, like, but she just did not. And I felt like she wasn't listening because she was asking questions. So the seller showed up and I was talking to them for like two hours. We covered so much and then she was asking random questions. Like she, we could tell she wasn't listening and like, okay. So I'm like, forget it. I'm going to contact the selling this because I didn't sign anything. And I, I con and she just sort of showed up. But the selling agent, I said, look, I can get a buying agent. They could give me a referral because, you know, I'm an agent or you can just do me a deal here. And she did. I still feel like, of course, she's on the side of the sellers. Um, we had a month to do inspections, but of course we are in another state and the, the, um, the, the home inspector, there's so many things that were not on that report that I came to find. And I'm just oh, like, wow. there's no one looking after me. Like, you didn't see this big crack <laughs> through a certain wall or, you know, that was a little bit more than a possible, you know, settlement crack or, you know, it just, there was a few questions that came up. And then I, right. I thought, wow, I, I feel like, of course, they were on their side, you right. know, and they weren't looking out for me and pointing things out because I know as a buy agent, I've gone and have picked it apart, you know, especially during inspection, because you want to get repairs or credits and look out for your buyer. But it, yeah. there's just so many factors that are involved with dual agency, like you say, that everyone can yeah. feel like they didn't get represented well. Definitely. Definitely. And what, Rachel, what's the best way you can protect yourself if you do go into a dual agency um, agreement? Um, well... <laughs> If you do go into one, I think you could actually have an attorney look over um, any documentation or another or a real estate broker. You can have someone independently look over it. Um, I guess that would be my advice because if you're in that situation, you're all, you're already you know represented by somebody, and 
there's not much you can do other than have someone look, look through all the paperwork for you. And, and as an agent, is it to disclose everything? You mean as an agent? If, yeah. Oh, if, if you're, you're, oh, if you're yeah. an agent. Okay, if you're an agent, you're saying if you're an agent and you yeah. are representing two parties? Yes. Um, you know, in that situation, I would probably, assuming that your broker obviously allowed you to do that, I, would, I might want to get the broker involved and just have the broker look over everything. And if there are any questions along the way from your seller or your buyer, you could always um, have them, you know, do an independent review with an attorney or something. But that kind of, you know, then they're paying for, for that advice. So it kind of, yeah. most people well, aren't going to want to do that. And it's tricky. I actually was wondering uh, to disclose. I mean, um, there's um, there's a borderline there because if you are representing a seller and they provide information to you, and then you can't disclose yeah. that to the buyer, but you have a obligation to the buyer also. So okay. how do you gauge the the disclosure for both on both sides? Well, see, that's the problem because as an agent, if you're representing a seller and you have any knowledge of something that needs to be disclosed, you have to disclose it. If you withhold disclosing that to your buyer, then you're liable and you're probably going to be sued. So you, if, you're, if your buyer tells you, um, you know, oh, I had a little flood here in my laundry room and there was some mold behind the wall, but, you know, uh, my husband and I cleaned it up and we patched it all up and it's fine. Um, you now have a duty to disclose this if, if the seller doesn't put that in the disclosures because they didn't do it the correct way. There was mold involved and you need to, that needs to be properly taken care of, right? So if, if you don't disclose that and now you're representing the buyer and you don't disclose that, then you're going to put yourself in a lot of trouble. You and your broker, you're going to put yourself in a position because one day if they open up that wall or there's another problem where someone smells something and they discover it and, oh my gosh, this wasn't disclosed, yeah. So when you're so talking, they could go back. They well, could go back to the agent even for help. Yes. Well, that also, if they say something, if they contact the seller and sue them, the seller could say, well, I told my agent that. Exactly. You yeah. know, it's like they yeah. can try to pass the buck. And I was also thinking when you were mentioning that, I mean, whether you're doing dual representation or not, when you're talking to your seller, you're going to tell them, whatever yes. you tell me, whether I'm representing that buyer or not, I have to disclose. Exactly. And I've had that happen before. I've had, I've had where sellers have filled out all the disclosures. They didn't tell me anything. And then after the disclosures, they made a comment like, oh, and blah, 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 when this happened. And I said, wait, what? This isn't in your disclosures. And they said, oh, it's okay. It's not a big deal. I said, no, we need to amend the disclosures. This needs to go in there. And we did because you're exactly right. If you know something as an agent, you've been told something, then you have a duty to disclose it. And you know, you're in that situation, my seller would thought, oh no, it's not really a big deal. And I said, well, but it is <laughs> because I can't, I can't risk my, you know, myself and my reputation in being possibly sued. And you can't risk yourself being sued. So you have to disclose these things. And it ended up working out fine and, you know, um, but luckily, I found that out in the in the transaction when the you know before we sent the disclosures out to the buyer, I didn't know. So I did dis I did disclose it, and I did put it in my own agent digital inspection disclose uh, disclosure as well that I had been told. So uh, yes, disclosure disclosing is one of the or the main reason for lawsuits in real estate failure to disclose. So we have to be really really careful with that. I think um, it also helps if you're taking time with your seller rather because I know there's times I've, I've thrown a form at them going, Hey, fill it out, get it back to me. But yeah. to really maybe sit with them and go over it with them because sometimes you'll see them tilt their head and think, and you might actually get more information. So you're getting full disclosures rather than someone saying, I don't want to do my homework and I'm just checking. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, so as if you sit down and go over each question with them, I think you will find out a lot more information. So it nothing, the less is likely to pop up later. Right. <laughs> it, it's really scary though. I mean, I sold a house a couple of years ago that was um, the, I was representing the buyer and the seller had lived in the house for about 30 years. And when I got the disclosures, I called the agent and said, uh, I've lived in my house for 20 years and I know I could write a book on it. There was nothing in these disclosures. Nothing. Yeah. Surely something's been replaced. Surely there's been a problem. Surely something happened in the past 30 years that your seller can remember. So the agent went back to the seller and they filled a few things out. But 
lo and behold, now there's a, there's a big lawsuit going on. Major, wow. major issues that weren't disclosed. I mean, it was the worst in my whole career that I've ever seen. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it could really, it could really haunt you for years, whatever oh, yeah. it is. Oh. Yeah, there's no, so way that, the red flags. there's no way that these sellers didn't know about the problems because they had them fixed. So, you know, it's like if you have a flood and you have it fixed, right? How right. do you not know? <laughs> right. I don't know. Anyway. Wow. Well, I think really that's, that's amazing uh, information that you've shared with us, Rachel. I, I really, really appreciate that. Now, um, Monica, Nanette, uh, Alma, did you guys find this very useful for, for you guys? Yes, thank you. Yeah, very much. I, I did because a lot of um, agents will push to, to say it's fine. And it's very rare that you find um, agents go, you know what, I prefer to not do it or I don't think it's the best idea for everyone. So yeah, that because I, I feel the same, like I would try to avoid it. <laughs> Just serve one yeah. party rather than the other. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. What about you, Alma? Are you there, Alma? We lost it. <laughs> I, think I have one other experience to add from a, um, a, a listing that I had. The um, buyer's um, agents, they sent a team member with them. I did the open. I met with them. I know they had a buying agent, which is fine. And then if they were there for the inspections. I was there for inspections and everything else. And this team member was there every time. And the, the buyers really were upset that they felt like their agent wasn't there for them. And the one that they'd sent wasn't really seasoned or knowledgeable. And um, when we closed and I picked up my lockbox, um, we chatted and I just said, you know, I was glad I want to help you. Well, they actually sent me referrals, not their buying agent they sent me the list the, the because they saw me working and making things happen and always being there for the seller yep so that I've, was I've, I've had the same thing i had the same thing happen too it's always nice it, it's unfortunate that there are people in the business that don't stick around and hold your hand you know the hands of your clients through the whole thing right i've actually had uh shown up to a home inspection i was the the listing agent and the the buyers showed up and their agent wasn't there. Right. And I called the agent. I said, uh, your buyers can't be in this house by themselves with the home inspector. And they, they said, oh, well, you're there. It's <laughs> 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 not It's not my job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's not, that's we not all good. Have, yeah, we all have great referrals. Well, Nanette, um, I know we can't see you, but uh, how, how did you feel about this session? Was it useful for you? It was very informative, yeah. And um, especially the one part about when Rachel started saying that uh, to ask the buyer that might want to use the listing agent to ask them if uh, if somebody was suing you, would you want to use that lawyer, their lawyer, to represent you? I thought that was a really nice little touch. Um, I'll be using that in the future. That's Thank good. You. That, okay. that analogy always hits home with people because they don't really understand until you put it in that perspective. A lawyer has a fiduciary duty very much like a real estate agent does. Awesome. Now, if you guys wanted to connect with um, our future episodes, um, we will be doing this uh, every month. Uh, you know, just get a hold of me. Uh, my number is 951-378-5316, and I would connect you to our future episodes and give you an invite, okay? Um, quickly, I just wanted to ask Alma. Alma, how did you find out about our um, event? Uh, I believe Rachel shared it on social media. Okay. And that's how I found out. All right, and Nanette, I know I invited you and, and Monica, so I'm glad that you guys are all here. Thank you so much. So uh, any last uh, comments, uh, Rachel? Um. I don't think there's anything I haven't said, but I think that it's definitely worth thinking very long and hard about um, doing something like this, be, being a dual agent. And um, I would advise anyone to speak with their broker as well and kind of get the perspective of the broker. But um, I don't plan to be doing these dual agent <clears throat> dual agencies any longer because I, I, 
Um, I don't want to be a hypocrite and I really, I really think and I've seen so many of them go wrong and I really think that it should not be allowed. Um, you know, and you can still find a way to work with that client down the road. I think that client's going to appreciate you if you, that buyer, if you explain to them why you can't work with them. Um, and, and Hey, but I can refer you to a great agent. I know, mm -hmm. you know, who's someone you really trust and that would be great. Cause then everyone has a great, uh, you know, strong person representing them and then everyone can feel good about it. So yeah. Problem okay. solved. <laughs> yeah. Take a reflection. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and um, definitely uh, feel free to connect with each other if you have any questions. Uh, Rachel, can they uh, call you if they have any questions about uh, dual agency again? Sure, my number is 760-310-9466. Okay, sounds good. And you know, this is all recorded and you can go back to Facebook and watch it and you can, uh, if you're not able to write down the phone numbers, you can do that later. Anyway, well, thank you so much. I think this is an amazing session. Thank you so much, Rachel, for uh, being available. And again, if you wanted to have a specific topic that we want to uh, put on our uh, future episodes, let me know and I can find the right experts to talk about the, the, the topic. So we will all learn from each other and, you know, make it really, really beneficial for everybody. Okay. Thanks, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to invite all of you on April 11. Uh, we're having a Fire Up Real Estate Boot Camp at the uh, Westin Sheraton Hotel in Carlsbad. Uh, that is going to be an amazing real estate um, educational seminar. Alma, if that is something that you are not aware of, let me know and I can send you the information. And then we also have a magazine that we're gonna we're working on right now. Uh, the magazine is gonna be um, for finest women in real estate. Uh, so we are featuring a real estate broker in San Diego. And if you are interested in having your own magazine, again, talk to me and I can explain to you how you can benefit from that. As you all know, we have a TV talk show uh, for finest women in real estate. You can find all the TV shows uh, in YouTube. Um, in Facebook also, and in LinkedIn. And Rachel, we have a, 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 a couple of episodes there for you, right? Uh, oh, yeah. And she talked about dual agency in there. And you can watch those episodes. It's going to be good for you to learn more about it. And uh, that's pretty much it, okay? Thank well, you. thank you again. And uh, we'll see you again on next time, okay? Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.